Hello everyone. In this video, I would like to talk about the concept of spiritual exercise, what it is, and flesh it out, try to flesh it out with reference to an example. Greg Sadler, Dr. Greg Sadler, has a series of videos on Pierre Hadot and Hadot's book, Philosophy as a Way of Life. There are, to the best of my knowledge, there are five videos that Greg has produced. I put links to all of them below in the descriptions. I went through all these five videos today and I thought about discussing the idea of spiritual exercise in a slightly different way. I'm not going to repeat uh, Dr. Sadler's content here. Uh, so I encourage you to watch those videos before or after you listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to discuss it in a, discuss the topic in a somewhat personal way. First, I, I'll share with you a, a recent scenario, a story that has happened to me. And then I will offer a general general formula, general, my general idea about what we mean, what it means to engage in spiritual exercise. So recently I saw a book manuscript, a book that is close to publication, and this book is written by someone I know, a person I consider to be a friend and a colleague. Uh, she works in education and educational psychology, and in the manuscript, uh, in the book manuscript, she has included a quote from one of my videos. The quote is not my quote, it's not something I, I said, it's just something that I repeated, I shared in one of my videos. I, I think it was a video about the TV show Queen's Gambit. And in that discussion, I included a quote from Sam Rocha's book, The Syllabus as Curriculum. And uh, I believe my, my colleague has taken this quote from the video and has just included the quote in her, her book. But of course, there's no mention of me or my YouTube channel or my review of the book. And um, now I'm 99% sure, I would say 99.9% .9 sure that my colleague, my dear and esteemed colleague, hasn't read Sam Lucha's book, and she's including a quote based on my video, just based on my video. I don't care much about that personally. I see that as that all these kinds of things, people watching videos and taking uh, material out of it, referring to in their work to books that I discuss here or articles that I discuss here. I see all that as acceptable consequences of being on YouTube, having this kind of social media presence. Uh, I'm not here to protect, I don't think I can fully protect you know, the citations and references to, to my YouTube videos. And I, I see that as a, as a pointless endeavor. If I wanted prestige or citations or credits, I wouldn't be on YouTube. There's something else that I care about and I, that it is that something else that I want to discuss here. What I care about is that academic culture that encourages us, all of us, including myself, including my friend, including anybody who wants to succeed in the academic culture. That culture encourages us to take things in this way and strategically uh, give credit. So think about citing a book. If I cite a book, what does that mean? It means that I have read the book. Now think of mentioning a YouTube video in your book. <laughs> if I mention a YouTube video and give credit to a YouTube video, it suggests something else. It might suggest that I'm wasting my time watching YouTube videos, uh, wasting my efforts uh, in the scholarly gutters of the internet. You know, it's like pseudo scholarly gutters. So it is understandable that someone just mentions the book, even though they might not have read the book or the whole book. It is consistent with the convention, uh, with upholding the norms and values and signs of scholarly life, because the academic culture encourages us to show the signs that we are doing scholarly work, we are doing rigorous scholarly work. Now, while I was thinking about that, I thought about myself. I turned my attention towards my, myself, how I talk, how I write, and how I give credit. I am guilty of the same mistake. I mean, surprise, surprise, I'm an offspring of the same academic culture. Just take one example. I watched Greg Sadler for, I don't know, at least five, six years, I'm sure there were places where I should have given him credit and I didn't. I'm sure. I can't point to a specific place now, but I'm sure it has happened. You know, a, a place where I went and checked a book based on his discussions, based on a video that he has done and just talked about the book rather than talking about the, the way I found the book. In some cases, it, it was too obvious and it just jumped to my attention. And, like when I discussed Anselm or Plato, when I wrote a blog post about Plato, I mentioned uh, Greg's work. That's when I talked about Anselm, I mentioned Greg. In those cases, I couldn't help but make reference to, to his work. But I'm sure there are places where I maneuvered around properly giving credit to him and to many other people who I, I watch, I listen to, or I read through relatively unconventional outlets like blogs and podcasts or YouTube channels. Keep these thoughts in mind as we start going through 
Greg's and Pierre Hadot's discussion of spiritual exercise. Spiritual exercises, they aren't about knowing things from a distance. When we engage in an intellectual exercise, we, we might be just studying something from a distance, from a detached point of view. In my own case, if I just talk about or think about, or try to explain someone else's action, like a, a, a person who is an academic, if I try to think about that person's actions, think, try to explain or understand that other person, other people's actions, think about their mistakes, things that they do and I see to be wrong or questionable, if I just think about others, I'm not engaging in anything that resembles spiritual exercise. To do the spiritual, to make the exercise spiritual, I have to bring myself into it. I have to recognize myself in the problem, reflect on myself, not looking at myself as detached and distant uh, from the problem. Then as I begin to reflect on myself and my own actions, I can start looking for moments of decision. There are moments that arise in which I have decisions to make. When, when is the next time I'm encountering a situation, for example, when I can give somebody credit, when I can give credit to Greg Sadler, to say explicitly, directly, unambiguously that I have learned from him, that I have read philosophers that I wouldn't have read without his work on YouTube, people like Gabriel Marcel or Anselm or Shestov, for example. When is the next moment of decision? And this is an aspect of spiritual exercise, preparing for the next moment of decision when I can redirect my, myself, my actions. I can do something that is not habitual. Being ready for moments of decision, being more mindful, being uh, keeping watch, recognizing the moments of decisions that might, might come up. With that example in mind, let me try to put this in a more general form. We act against some background. We are always acting against some backgrounds within some situation. And in that situation, there are habits. There are personal habits, the habits that I have, habits that you have. And then there are also cultural habits, conventions, norms. And those habits are forces. They're, they force our hand towards particular decisions and against other decisions, against alternatives. So those habits, personal habits, cultural habits, societal habits, conventions, norms, those are forces that guide our unreflective actions towards so some direction. And it's not just about actions and habits. Those habits point to a kind of worldview. They are habits, types of behaviors that have become habitual in academic culture that signify a very cynical worldview. So our habits say something about the world in which those habits make sense, in which those habits are supposed to be rewarding, are supposed to be the right sort of actions in a world when it is it becomes habitual to cheat to not be honest that's the kind of world that that nurtures and rewards cynicism now against that background against those habits against the world view that those habits point to those actions point to we can resist in very small ways in, in, in a small moment we can stand up against those habits against those conventions against those forces that when we are unref unreflective they force our hands in one direction rather than another. So when you pause, reflect, identify a habit and act against it with the intention to stand up for something, something you see as true, good, and beautiful and say, I want to stand up for this. I want to stand up for, for what I see to be the right decision, the right action. This is to me an instance of spiritual exercise. It can be a single isolated action, but at the same time, it is pointing to a worldview that is counter to the dominant worldview. It's a worldview that is more optimistic, maybe, or more hopeful, more loving. Whatever it is that you want to establish with your action, with that change of habits. So we are not just moving against habits. We are also moving against a worldview. I'm also reading Raoul Eshelman's book on metamodernism. It is called Performatism or the End of Postmodernism. And in the first chapter of that book, he talks about a dogmatic aesthetic or aesthetic standpoints that we adopt dogmatically. That is what we need in spiritual exercise, especially an exercise that goes against habits, personal, societal, cultural habits. When we go against the habits of cynicism, habits that represent a cynical worldview, we are acting based on a dogmatic aesthetic. We are being dogmatic. We are saying that I don't need evidence to support my decision. My own belief is enough. We are acting knowing that this act can be just an isolated instance. We might recognize that even I, the same person, might fail in the future to renew this stance, this standpoint, to repeat this action. 
in the, in, in the future, the next, next time the moment of decision arises. But in principle, it's an act that could be repeated, could be imitated by myself, by yourself, or by other people. And I don't mean, of course, mindless imitation. When we imitate the act that signifies a better world, a better worldview, we are moving toward that world. We are trying to get closer to being in that world, in that better world, by being participants that act in accordance to that world. And that world might not be present now, but we are, in, with our actions, we are saying that we want to get closer to that world. All right, again, uh, take a look at Greg Sadler's five videos on Pierre Hadot and philosophy as a way of life. If you have comments, questions, let me know. And we might continue this topic in future videos.